So I woke up this morning with no voice. <clears throat> Part of that hydration thing. Uh, you might want to take the volume down a bit. It's, it's not good. Um, so you're going to have to bear with me. And I'm going to try to make this thing last. And if I'm antisocial after this, it's only because I need to give a talk tomorrow, too. So I'm going to try to drink the honey, hydrate, do whatever I can. But I got on the plane with a uh, head cold that's pretty good in Virginia, but that's because we have humidity. So anyway, uh, first of all, I'm unbelievably honored to be here. Uh, I've been a strength conditioning professional since 1990. I've done whatever I could in my career to try to bridge the gap between sports medicine and performance at every stage. And what I realized when I first started working in college and pro athletics is I functioned almost more as a marriage counselor than a clinician, strength coach, or educator. Because I would step into, and I guarantee you, <clears throat> you've touched this situation somewhere. This side of the hall is sports medicine ultra conservative, don't do anything new or you'll hurt somebody and we'll all get fired. Over here, I just saw this on the internet and we need to try it because it'll make us bigger, stronger, faster, let's do it, more is better, okay? These are two oversimplifications of two professions that should have the same semantics, same principles, and same goals. Just at a different time and place on someone's continuum. If you're in pain, unfortunately, the solution isn't there. It doesn't mean you can't suck it up. I'm going to play hurt for you for an hour and 15 minutes today. That's the only claim to fame I have as an athlete, by the way. Track and football, the only thing you can say about Gray Cook's athletic careers, that guy could play hurt. <laughs> Almost as well as he could play well, which doesn't say a lot for my performance. It blows me away, being a physical therapist and a strength coach, how many of the same principles get overlooked. We argue about methodology. We find a methodology we like, we find a lifting style we like, we find a clinical thing we like, and all of a sudden, we become a disciple of that. We lose our clarity, we lose our objectivity, we lose our professionalism when we blindly follow a methodology without asking questions. So our methodologies, our tests, our training, our programming should support our principles. And if we haven't clearly defined our principles, shame on us, that's all. So in the movement book that took me way longer to write than it will take you to read, I promise, and it's a boring read, but it's a lot to say because we arrived here in the 2000s with a bunch of ways to make people perform better without first establishing movement health. Movement performance is based on movement health. What is movement health? Well, before we get too enamored with our own definitions of movement health, it shouldn't hurt when you move. We'll try to leave it at that. Now, if you lifted really hard yesterday, or if you're an MMA fighter and got your butt kicked yesterday, then you're going to hurt today. And you're going to be a little bit better the next day, and that's fine. I'm not talking about delayed onset muscle soreness, and I'm not talking about sucking up fatigue and doing what you know how to do. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when your joint is painful and it doesn't get better with a workout. And I'm talking about when the foam roll helps temporarily but you need it again and again and again and again and again, that's a medical problem. And you can try to address it with a fitness solution. And you can be utterly disappointed when a medical professional drops the ball. But don't be surprised by that. Medical professionals are human. They're at a different spot in their evolution as a professional. And they make just as many mistakes as a fitness professional or strength conditioning professional. I did the bulk of this presentation at Stanford in front of Stu McGill because I think the internet somewhat called it a slight debate, which got a lot of people to show up. And they thought me and Stu were going to fight. Um, we didn't fight. We respected each other. One of, one of Stu's issues 
with the movement screen right out of the gates was he feels that a lot of people do a movement screen and think they've done everything. And I'll be the first to tell you, you've only done the first thing. You've established health. And on that foundation, you need to build performance. If you skip that foundation, you're going to find that the foundation won't support some of the load you put on it. So I don't think for a minute that a movement screen is going to predict who the best athlete in the room is or is going to diagnose why you got low back pain at mile three. That's not what the point of the movement screen is. If I need to diagnose your problem, I'm going to do a medical movement screen, which is called an SFMA, and I'll tell you a little bit about that because that's how we get athletic trainers, physicians, chiropractors, and physical therapists to say the same thing the same way. Treat it different if you want. Tape it, needle it, scrape it, I don't care what you do. But see it and discuss it the same way. At the end of my portion of the speech at Stanford, I guess when we're summing up why we're here, I want you to remember two words that, that, that put me here. And they, they were words that my dad uses all the time. I'm here to improve communication and create more accountability. And I did it in the first clinic I had, and I did it to myself. And it made my days longer, and it might made my cases harder, but ultimately things got more clear, and I've been able to develop team after team after team of medical professionals and performance professionals that work together like frickin' seals instead of backbiting each other, arguing over who needs the athlete now. Your systems will tell you where the person belongs. Your programs, your ideas, your innovation, your exercises will be subordinate to your systems because the variety is infinite. Just don't break a principle to get there. In the movement book, I laid down some principles. First principle, separate pain. Compartmentalize it. If you have low back pain in the deep squat, we used to just quit squatting you. But that doesn't solve a problem and you're gonna use that pattern every time you jump, every time you climb, every time you address the bar for a clean or a deadlift in many cases. So we can't avoid a movement pattern. Now, if you've got a permanent disability, a medical record that says never do that again, that's different. But until you have that kind of clarity, don't avoid a pattern. Investigate it. Get it evaluated. Get it looked at. The lost art of evaluation is the number one disappointment I had when I got out of physical therapy school. Because everything I learned in physical therapy school is part of what I'm going to try to deliver to you today. We largely attacked human performance from a cellular physiology level but you're way more than a big bag of cells. You're a big bag of behaviors totally unique to you. You got chondromalacia patella, and so does she. The exact same medical diagnosis, the same CPT code, the same frickin' copay, and all, you got the same therapist. Do you get the same therapy? No. His chondromalacia won't allow him to squat and hers won't allow her to stand on one leg without falling. Their behaviors are completely different in the exact same medical situation. Do they deserve to be treated the same way? Absolutely not. But had I not asked them to move, they'd be getting the same damn thing for four damn weeks. She can't balance, and it's gonna mess up her gait cycle. I don't even need to watch her walk. If you can't stand on one foot for five seconds, you got a gait deviation, even if you can hide it. So I'm not gonna sit here and analyze gait. That's an art that most people develop over years. But I can tell if you can stand on one foot and not on the other. Virginia State Troopers know how to do that. It's called a field sobriety test. <laughs> Ask Lee Burton how he knows. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you like that example? Because I can show you shoulder impingement, low back pain, scoliosis, same structure, same medical name, 
different human behavior response. If your screens and assessments don't capture the human quality, all you've got is a bunch of data. All you got is a bunch of data. I don't know why a painful knee affected her single leg stance and his squat. And I don't know whether pain is causing poor movement or poor movement is generating pain. That means I'm not gonna screen either of them. They're already in pain. They said, my knee hurts. And in the presence of that knee pain, that movement pattern is affected one way, that movement pattern is affected another way. So as you can see, your movement pattern alone does not tell me where your problem is. There's a completely different way we discern that. And I already wrote it down for you, it's in the movement book. I showed the medical movement screen to every fitness professional who ever wanted to pick up that book. And I showed the functional movement screen to every medical professional who ever wanted to actually generate somebody who was not only pain free, but also not dysfunctional. I said this yesterday in our workshop, the number one risk factor for a future injury is a previous injury. And there's only two things to pull from that piece of information. Every injury alters you permanently for the worse, or the rehabilitation model is incomplete. And unfortunately, both statements are true. But I think the second one is far more true and the only one we can do anything about. Okay? So unfortunately, some of us are going to get injured. And we'll never be able to do what we used to do again. Get over it. I've eaten that slice of humble pie about eight times. There are a lot of things I can't do that I used to could, and I got the surgical scars and stuff to prove it. Some stupid, some unavoidable, some totally self-imposed. You learn. So I'm not here saying that everybody can move well. I'm saying the more we know about your limitations, the more we know about setting baselines, the better off we'll be. So I offered up two principles in the movement book. Number one, separate pain. It's going to cloud your judgment. If I got somebody who doesn't hurt but can't touch their toes, can't backward bend, has no hip extension on one side, I'll show you exactly what to do and where to start. But the minute pain's involved, we got, we got to look at it. I'm sorry. Stick your head in the sand, cover it up with ibuprofen, Hope it goes away. Get you a men's fitness and read it cover to cover. See if you can help. Type your symptoms into Google and it will more than oblige with completely differing opinions about a general statement about your specific problem. It hasn't compartmentalized your behavior. It hasn't done a responsible professional screen or exam. But look how many people are consuming self-help on the internet now. And if I had to describe it, they are seeking a fitness solution to a medical problem, and it's because the medical team that they had dropped the ball or only focused on their specialty. When I get you out of low back pain, that does not mean you're functional. Just because your low back doesn't hurt doesn't mean your single leg stance came back. It just means I got your symptoms down. And I might have done that by taping you up, putting you in a brace, and telling you to rest and not work out. But at some point, you want to live again. Unless a physical therapist is personally involved in fitness, many of their exercise recommendations for how not to get injured again are stupid. Seriously, they are. We don't learn enough about training and conditioning in physical therapy school to program you successfully to lose weight or run faster. If we had that as an adjunct profession, or parallel skill set maybe, but physical therapy school doesn't do that for you. Nor does a education in performance or personal training get you ready for the kind of responsibility you got when you're advising somebody about their pain. Because if that pain's being caused by bone cancer and you sell them a foam roll for six months, that six months is wasted when early detection could have been the only thing to save their life. So don't be cavalier with pain. Don't treat it like a mom with an only child either and be scared of it. 
It is a signal that calls for responsible professional action. And if I run you through a battery of movement tests and none of those movement tests stir up your pain, then we may need a heavier load test. So very often we don't see the pain until you're in mile three of a run. Well, then we've got to do those tests. But we can't stop investigating and we must give you an intelligent explanation for what you're doing to yourself, what your workout's doing to you, and what you can do to solve that. Pain is a signal. That's all. And we've got to create a model within performance to deal with that. And here's why. Who's the front line of defense? The conditioning professional. You might want to say the athletic trainer, but you've got no reason to see the trainer unless you decide to see the trainer. Everybody sees the strength coach every day, and I'm talking about the athletic trainer, but everybody sees the strength coach, everybody sees the conditioning coach, everybody sees the personal trainer. That's the first line of defense. When we tried to get a, uh, a hold on scoliosis back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, who did we empower to do scoliosis screening? PE teachers. Now, did PE teachers assume for a minute that they had to correct the scoliosis or just participate in early detection? You won't be able to correct all the problems you uncover. You will often need an ally to help correct those, some of those problems you uncover. It does not mean you're not being a professional. You're being a specialist and not stepping outside of your specialty to try to solve a problem for somebody who's not interested in dealing with two different professionals. One to program their fitness future and one to deal with the injuries of their past. It's gonna take a team. It takes a team to manage a team, but it also takes a team to manage an individual in many cases. When that individual has certain signs and symptoms, What I've noticed time and time again in the fitness industry and in the performance industry is we are totally aware of our problems. Gray Cook and movement screening science and everything we know about movement doesn't need to stand up here and tell you that flexibility is a big problem in strength conditioning. That creating metabolic packages that don't break people down but actually make them come back stronger. You know all that, but here's where we make the mistake. We are so empathetic we are so helpful, we are so inspired to make the world move better that we often seek the solution before we clearly define the problem. And in there lies our biggest problem. When you go to a fitness conference, your next fitness conference, look at the ratio of assessment, screening, and testing information compared to exercise, workout, and programming information. And what you'll see is that we want to shoot bullets. We don't want to aim at targets. We like shooting. We like the gun that goes like this. We don't like the one that goes like that because everybody can see when we miss. But I've always looked at it the other way. Everybody in the room knows when I hit too. You got to play it a little bit tighter. You got to play it a little bit tighter, okay? There's plenty of people out there who are going to do the other thing so you want to distinguish and define yourself? Do what the carpenters do. They measure twice and they cut once. They don't shoot and then aim, they aim and then shoot. Clearly define every step you make with someone's program and every recommendation you make for another professional service or even a professional referral. Your referrals reflect you. I send somebody to somebody who drops the ball, that reflects on me. Ball's back in my court. You didn't catch the pass, I'm still responsible for it. So you do need to really think about who your professional referrals are. I have some people in the profession of physical therapy, they're buddies, I went to college with them, drink beers with them, I don't send patients to them. They're not that kind of buddy, okay? Because they're not gonna do anything that I haven't already done. I need somebody to do what I can't do, and so a personal relationship doesn't necessarily mean that's my best professional referral. So think about that. 
It's always good to go through these three things when you're ready to adopt something new or think differently about something. Or question what you know about something. This is an awesome book. It's been out for a while, but it's one of those reads that about every 18 months, you'll get something new out of it. People don't care what you do until they know why you're doing it. It is an inherent quality about human education where if people don't know your intent, they will not hear what you're doing. The one compliment I've consistently gotten in my career, both as a strength coach and a physical therapist, is I've never had somebody look at me that way. I've never had somebody look at everything like that. Now, don't you think for a minute that I got the time, time, I got the time and convenience to spend an hour doing that? Most of what they complimented me on was the same block of time somebody else used to take a history and tell them their credentials. I didn't take more time. I applied more quality and systemization. So everything did like that. Look at these movements, check these reflexes, do those tests, whatever the issue is. If they need to be more fit or if they need to recapture their health, I do a battery of tests that leaves no stone unturned. And not for a minute do I think you're telling me the truth. If you knew what was wrong with you, if you knew why you weren't dropping weight and if you knew why you were in pain, you wouldn't be standing here in front of me. So I appreciate your story or your paradigm, why you can't lose weight or why you think your knee hurts. And I, I have this expression. And I'm not saying, I got a two and a half year old who thinks she knows why the sky's blue. So when she tells me, I'm like, I don't discount it. I don't step on it. They got to get that out. They got to tell you what they think it is. And then you do your investigation. You know how many times knee pain isn't a knee problem? Ask me, do you know how many times knee pain isn't even the biggest problem? It's hip stability, which causes inappropriate knee alignment, which creates tendonitis, which is symptomatic right here. But let's give you a bunch of anti-inflammatories and see if it goes away. It doesn't go away because you're making more inflammation and now you've got this whole pain response, this whole pattern that we gotta capture. The why statement for movement screening is we scrutinize functional methods without metrics. Digest that for a minute. We make decisions about how we're gonna move a human being for their good without enough baseline or other data points to see if we actually made a difference. Now, it's real easy to get here and I'm gonna give us some oversimplification. Most high schoolers still wanna do that bench press. How much can you bench? We're guys and we're obligated to ask that of each other. <laughs> How much do you bench? He knows, you know, you want to tell me, don't you? I think I'm going to be impressed, don't you? Tell me. About 345. About 345. Huh? There's two girls in the back, just. Like and now there's some guy somewhere in here going, is that all? <laughs> We're guys, we got to measure stuff, I'm sorry. <laughs> So if we're only looking at the bench press and we're only looking at a strength gain, then we'll be pretty impressed with what a bench, a bar, and some plates, and a little bit of programming can do, especially if you throw in some negatives and some supersets and stuff like that. But what's happening to your shoulder mobility? Shoulder mobility might be going down, it might be going up. We can't assume that the bench press makes you tight, but we can't assume that it won't. Some people, because of the structure of their shoulder, the fact that they're naturally hypermobile, 
will be able to increase their bench press and do that with their hands behind their back. And some people are already working with a little bit less mobility, and when they tell their brain that this is really the only reason you have arms, this right here, and this right here, and a little bit more of this, and some more of that, and maybe this hand just to keep balance, you know, but do this and do that, then you really don't have a reason to do that. And so your brain is not going to allocate precious calories and resources to maintain movement patterns that you don't use. This entire thing sits here to help you find pleasure, help you avoid pain, and to be as efficient as possible whenever possible. And sometimes the most efficient way for someone to deadlift is to do it incorrectly. Bend over and just pick it up. Don't use good mechanics because when we tell them to use good mechanics, it's much harder work on the front end, but your gains and your safety are greater on the back end. So how do we sell technique? Well, first of all, make technique not so hard. When somebody has so many flexibility problems that they can't even get in the proper position, stop coaching and start correcting. Indirect coaching and direct coaching are two different things. Direct coaching means give me that neutral spine, shoulders back, boop, now do your pull and it looks better immediately. He's ready to learn and a few words got me better motor control, got me better technique. If I find myself saying that for the fourth time, either he's got his iPod in or he can't do what I'm saying. And if he can't do what I'm saying, I shouldn't say it. And actually, I should know it beforehand. I should know when he's coachable and when he's not coachable. When you have significant mobility problems, you are uncoachable. I can program you and offer up a correction. I can even say, that's so stiff that it's not responding to stretching. There could be some underlying stuff there. Let's get you checked out. Musculoskeletal exam. I know you're not hurting that bad, but your flexibility is not changing. Your system isn't budging. There's a reason for that. But I don't stop pushing. Why doesn't your knee bend? I don't know. It just doesn't bend. We start bending it. We find out the reason it hasn't bent back there is there's a little tear in your meniscus. And now you've been reminded of that again. But much better here than hiking down that trail with a pack on. We've got to find it. We've got to explore it. We got to figure out what these things are. We debate methods too much. One of my favorite lines from Dan John is everything works. And he's right for about six weeks. Everything works for six weeks. Now we got the placebo effect in there. By the way, is there any medical measure that doesn't respond to the placebo effect? Heart rate variability doesn't. Heart rate variability is immune to the placebo effect. If I do something to get your heart rate variability in check, you're in check. That doesn't mean it doesn't go off the skids every time I do a compromised pattern on you. But there are certain things we can watch. We can watch the way people breathe. We can watch the way they hold their body. There's no placebo effect for flexibility. You can't touch your toes, there's not much I can say to get you there. I can put you on a program to get you there. But we gotta do that, we gotta measure these things and we shouldn't be debating things that we don't have enough information on. And I realize that's gonna kill about 75% of internet traffic, but let the people on the internet do what they do. We're in the trenches, we work, some of us like to talk about it a little bit, that's okay but make what you say principle-based, not method-based. First two principles in our movement book. Separate pain, number two, set a baseline. Don't talk about stuff that you're doing to somebody if we don't know where they were, if we don't have a baseline. That is the absolute brilliance behind concussion management right now in football. Not just running out on the field and making sure you're stable and all these return to play criteria. If I don't have a sample of your cognitive processing beforehand, then I won't know how screwed up it is when you get your bell rung. 
So the first test we do for concussions is when you don't have a concussion, isn't it? Doesn't that make sense? We wanna know what your brain's like before somebody your size running faster than you hit you in the head. That way, if your brain is not normal, we can compare it to a normal measure. Why does your first movement test need to be after your first injury? Why shouldn't your first movement test be before your first injury? And when are our most injuries gonna occur? Right about the time we decide to get our ass more active. And what is that? That's at the end of a long rest period, at the end of the flu or pneumonia or whatever sidelines you. And now I'm getting ready to get somebody programming me up. I'm gonna go back out there, change my life. Why aren't we doing a screen then? Because we know stuff's gonna happen. Number one, I wanna screen you know how you move so I can program you better. I wanna make sure we don't have an underlying health problem because an underlying health problem will not support a performance program for long. Just won't do it. We talked about this yesterday. A lot of people have tried to prove that the FMS is actually a good performance test but they're looking at it like this, not like this. If you don't move well, you can still get a gold medal today. I just don't know if you'll be getting a bunch of them. It's a risk factor, just like high cholesterol or hypertension. It's just a risk factor. It doesn't mean it's gonna kill you, and it doesn't mean you can't perform well. It just means all things being equal, somebody without those problems is probably gonna be here longer doing that than you are. That's all that means. So I wanna get away from this whole injury prevention model because it's not sexy and we don't go there to prevent injury. We go there to perform better. And to perform better, we need to be healthy and we don't need those things that cause us to compensate, substitute and move poorly, compounding that. So if you agree that the best time to do a concussion test is before the concussion, then Monday morning, you better be doing something other than making a program for somebody you never met before. You gotta run them through something. We tried to create a screen that was intentionally not an assessment. It doesn't talk about body parts, it talks about movement patterns. Our exercises, our correctives are not broken down by body part. They're broken down by movement pattern. Now I'll tell you a quick little story, and then I'll show you some slides. I like to see how long I can talk before I switch the slides sometimes. It's just, you know. Zero to three years of age. We don't measure your flexibility and we don't give a about your strength. What do we look at zero to three years of age? Movement-wise, do we care if you can side plank for two minutes? What was your bench when you were two, dude? <laughs> 42 pounds. Zero to three, as long as your child is crawling by a certain age, we don't care. Some roll early, some get more head control left than right. But by that developmental milestone, that little mark in time, everybody seems to hit the mark. The few that don't, that's a red flag. This child isn't rolling by a certain age. Let's get them looked at. Sometimes we find out that they have a sensory motor problem. Sometimes we find out that they have a brain injury. Sometimes we find out that they got a dislocated shoulder and nobody knew it and they don't want to roll to that side. But they're so freaking flexible, nobody can tell. There's a lot of reasons why a child won't move, but we wouldn't look at any of them unless we used it as a biomarker. If they're not rolling by a certain age, we're looking at something. It doesn't matter what that something is, the fact that we're looking means we're gonna find it. But we wouldn't even be looking if we weren't looking at that milestone. And if they're not crawling by a certain age, or walking by a certain age, or talking by a certain age, then we are alarmed. But as long as they meet their minimum, their milestone, we don't mess with them. That means that we manage babies, and we manage babies very well from a movement perspective by not looking at parts, 
but by looking at patterns. And only when the pattern is bad do we look at a part. Because if you start looking at body parts in isolation without looking at a pattern, you're going to waste a lot of time on a link in the chain that ain't even close to the weakest link. You're going to find internet articles that support your decision and a bunch of methodology to allow you to interact with this body part. And it will make a bit of difference in the way somebody moves in the grand scheme of things. So even though I need you to know the body parts, I need you to interact with that working knowledge of anatomy. The way we deal with the human organism is we compartmentalize the most dysfunctional movement behaviors and call them like we see them. Now, if it's not dysfunctional, then we need to learn a term. Good enough. Most people in this room feel like your blood pressure is good enough. And most of you are right. Now, if you get a two on the deep squat and the movement screen, it's good enough. But I need a three, because it'll mean I'm a better person, right? Twos, you're out. But don't be worse than that. Manage health problems from the bottom up, not the top down. Vision, good enough. Hearing, good enough. Respiration, good enough. Movement, good enough. Blood pressure, good enough. Triglycerides, good enough. All I need is good enough. That's enough health to get you a gold medal, to fly an airplane, or to climb a telephone pole. Now, these are specific activities that are going to require more training, but they're all built on the same health base. You know how many different sports have wanted me to build them a movement screen for their own particular sport? And I'm like, you use the same friggin' eye chart, and you use the same blood pressure cuff. You use the same body comp, you use the same bathroom scales. Movement is movement. What you do with it is your sport is your tactical job, is your occupation. But movement is movement. Now, here's the funny thing. When we start looking at sports like golf and we see strength coaches trying to generate rotational power, we just assumed that since they're golfers and they rotate, we should exercise rotation. Don't really need to. Don't really need to. What should we do? Maintain the movement patterns. These people already know how to swing a golf club hard enough to freaking kill you. I can swing one hard enough to just really piss you off and make you limp a little bit. <laughs> if they hit you with a golf club in most places, you will die. All right? That's how hard they're swinging the golf club. And they're not big and they're not brawny, but they know how to create that acceleration. And the experts in motor learning know that if we're not doing an exercise at or near the speed of competition, you're pretty much just burning calories. And if a golfer, a pro golfer is going to burn calories, they should probably do it hitting a bucket of balls or dealing with course management. And I work in the PGA, so I think I'm qualified to say that. Do you know the one thing we noticed of all the golfers who make a really good living at golf, either teaching it or playing it or both? in the movement screen. Do you know the one movement pattern that the, the best of the best seem to cluster and all have in common? The deep squat. But not because they're retrieving putts. Most of them retrieve a putt like that. Reading a putt, most of them don't have their heels on the ground. They pop their heels up, right? The reason good golfers have retained their deep squat is not because the squat's important to golf. It's because the squat demonstrates uncompromised hip mobility, and that's important to golf. So believe it or not, you could help more golfers who've sought your help by not giving them golf-specific rotation stuff and bands and fancy gadgets. Give them their squat. And if you run out of room in the squat and they're so stiff they're never going to get much better than you just got them, then at least make sure they own their deadlift. And once they own the deadlift, you can teach them a single leg deadlift, which is about how to shift your weight, which is what golf is, single leg deadlift. Make sure I can do it on this side, make sure I can do it on this side. Most of the best golfers I've ever worked with had a little problem, a little glitch, and they wouldn't finish hard on their left. And a single leg deadlift exposed the fact that they didn't want to be on their left. And since I took away the medical reason they couldn't be on their left, 
Now all we got to do is train left single leg deadlifts. And they're right back where they need to be. We didn't rotate them once. He already knew how to rotate. He makes a million dollars a year rotating. I'm going to design a drill out there that's going to help him rotate better? No. What are the, what are the lockups in the body, guys? What are the lockups in the body? T-spine. T-spine's a lockup in the body. You know why? We don't, we don't breathe well. We don't enjoy breathing. We like sitting a lot and our head's way out here. So we get this rounded T-spine stuff. But there's a flip side to it. The reason you lose T-spine mobility isn't just under-training, over-training does it too. We've gotten so obsessive compulsive about having a strong core that we forgot to make a stable core first. If your core can't do this for you, and this for you, and this for you, I don't give a if your core can do this for you. But if your core can do this, and this, and this, and you're gonna do anything athletic, it better be able to do this too. I've got a new book in the works, and whenever I'm progressing somebody in exercise, three things. Breathing, bending, balancing. If they're not moving well, check their breathing first. If for some reason I put you in a pattern or a lift or a move and you start shallow breathing, there's a certain degree of anxiety there, there's a certain degree of emotion there, and it doesn't even mean you're conscious of it. It could be subconscious. Half the, half the things you balance are subconscious. You don't know you're doing it. So if you alter your breathing just because I put you in a different lift or a different pattern, I'm watching that. And I'm going to try to get you breathing good, but I won't tell you. I'll just have a conversation. I'll make you laugh. We'll do something I'm like shake it off, do it again, shake it off. I'm never going to talk to you about your breathing. I'm just going to see if I can get you breathing easier. And if I can't, then I'm going to make the pattern easier, reset your breathing, and work you back into that. I'm never going to mention breathing. I'm not going to talk to you about the way you breathe. That's stupid. Because now I'm self-conscious of it. You'll never get a representation of what I really do. The next is, if you're breathing okay, but you don't bend well enough, and what's that me saying? That's me saying your ankle, your knee, your hip, you've got fair flexibility. It doesn't have to be perfect. I don't care if you can palm the floor. Whenever I ask somebody to touch their toes, the ones that can always palm the floor, like they get extra credit for that. <laughs> you don't get extra credit, because if you have excessive motion in this direction, I'm probably gonna find reduced motion maybe in another direction. So I'm not impressed by your excess. All I need to do is establish a minimum criteria. If you don't bend, that is the reason you're not moving well. And if breathing and bending are good, then every lift in the world is a balancing act, isn't it? Whether you're doing body weight work, endurance work, sprinting work, or load work, isn't it about balancing? Isn't that what technique is all about? Stacking your joints, aligning your vectors, and acquisitioning your pushes and pulls. If somebody's moving, look at how they're breathing. And if they seem to be breathing okay, make sure they can bend enough to support this pattern. And if they can breathe and bend, they're just not balancing. And we coach balance. But we don't coach breathing and we don't coach bending. We make it possible. If your T-spine is tight, you're not breathing, you're anxious, we got to figure out something that's not intimidating you because you're not going to learn in this environment anyway. When you're shallow breathing and anxious, you're not going to learn. Your learning pathways are closed. We got to deal with parts, patterns, and performance. But my big pet peeve with a parts approach is it's okay in medicine because we've already looked at your patterns, or at least we should have. But the minute we start offering up mobility solutions without a pattern or a baseline, or stability solutions, we're talking methods without metrics. If you got a good system, measure something, do something, measure it again, I'll be impressed. But you gotta measure it first. You don't know how many people have offered me so many great solutions that would work in the FMS. The only thing they didn't do, a little bit disappointing to me, they got these great mobility techniques, these great corrective exercises. The only thing they never did is test it against the movement screen. I think you've got an awesome idea. Have you tested it? Because it looks like that should really improve somebody's squatting or somebody's shoulder mobility. How many screens have you done? Don't be scared of the truth. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You just learn something. You learn what not to do next time. 
How many light bulbs did uh, Thomas Edison make before one lit up? He still gets credit for lighting one up. If we look at performance and it's poor, we won't know what caused it. And if we look at performance and it's good, we won't know how long it's going to be there. We need more information. So I've always said this is your entry point. Don't look at the parts if the patterns look good. Just don't do it. There's more confusion than clarity. The human body is so complex, it's going to blow your mind. How the fascial system works to both support the muscular hydraulic and help align the joints. How the stabilizers, even though they're mostly slow twitch muscles, fire faster than the prime movers, which are mostly fast twitch muscles. The first muscles to fire are your stabilizers. Slow twitch doesn't mean they're slow. It means they're going to be there all day friggin' long, which is real good. The reason I'm passionate about old school workouts is they didn't offer shortcuts. Now I'm going to piss a lot of people off right now, but I've made it so far and haven't done it. God hadn't taken my voice away, so apparently I still got something to say. I got a big problem with a friggin' trap bar because it lets people who deadlift lift more weight. If you're going to deadlift, bend over and pick up a straight bar the way an expert says to bend over and pick up a straight bar. All of our, all the high schools that consult with me, they didn't throw their trap bars away. They use them for farmer's carry. But I don't call what you just did in that trap bar a deadlift. I won't do it. It's not fair to the deadlift and all the people who do it right. So exercise technology, exercise equipment has offered us many shortcuts to make people think that they're more fit than they are. We invented the modern running shoe that took away our authentic stride and allowed us to strike on our heel like we should when we walk and like we shouldn't when we run. Old school programs don't have shortcuts because they don't have fancy equipment and they got people running them. So the reason you see me as, as a modern professional migrating back to what Ed Thomas said about Indian clubs or what Pavel's saying about kettlebells or what Erwan LaCour is saying about move nat and primal move and stuff. The reason I'm talking about that is because they removed all the shortcuts. And everything you get on those platforms, you earn. You allow your body to adapt. You allow your movement patterns to mold. So we just remove the shortcuts. And when we go back to old school workouts, you don't even have to obsess on the movement screen because the constriction is built in there. If we never let people do cleans that couldn't do deadlifts, we wouldn't have some of the problems we do. If we established unbelievable deadlift before we ever loaded someone's squat, we would have followed a law of nature. Babies can lift way more in a uh, deadlift than a squat, and so can people who've never lifted. Let them get their competence with load on a deadlift and a single hinge before you do triple flexion extension. Your deep squat is first and foremost a mobile, maneuverable position used to evade harm and reduce your body posture. It can also be used for lifting, but make sure you know how to lift first. The deadlift is beautiful. Learn one, you can at least do a farmer's carry and learn a bunch, and maybe we can get you to a swing. And those things load you the way you were designed to be loaded. They put you on your strongest levers and let you get confidence so you're not scared of weight. And then if we want to do walk and lunges with a kettlebell overhead or we want to do back squats or something like that, that's fine. But it takes a very smart professional to keep it this simple. I hate to say it, Pavel, what Pavel said in his book Simple and Sinister, make sure you own your Turkish get up and make sure you can do a kettlebell swing. Anything else in life you decide to do, your base is there. It won't make you a good runner, but it'll give you a base that most runners don't have. It won't make you an expert climber, but it'll give you some strength and integrity that most climbers have to earn on a rock. It won't make you a better cyclist, but it'll let you stay in the saddle longer so you can become one. It won't make you a better golfer, but now you can hit three bucket of balls instead of one before fatigue. You want to show me how brilliant you are? Show me how friggin' simple you are. 
You want to show me how much I like you? Delete exercises from my workout and keep me at the same level of fitness. Don't keep adding more. Time is a precious resource to me. Show me how good you are by giving me the minimal effective dose of your professional training and conditioning knowledge and show me how much benefit there is. That's a pretty high bar, but if everybody in this room hits that bar, you will, you will never worry about making a resume again because you're working for yourself now. So if we're going to look at patterns, we got to look at them correctly. The pattern should follow a weakest link technology. It is my goal to find your weakest link. And sometimes your weakest link isn't movement. Sometimes it's a nutritional bottleneck. Sometimes it's an emotional problem that's causing a lot of physical stress and sometimes you're not getting enough sleep. Sometimes you're dehydrated and sometimes you think you're over your injury, but I say you're not. You're not in rehab till you say you're in rehab. You're in rehab till I say you're out of rehab. Unfortunately, because you don't have the metrics for me to say you're healthy. So you can pretend you're healthy, but your metrics don't say you are. So movement performance is the inspiring title of the common bond that brings us here. And movement performance is the pretty part of the house. It's the part we're going to look at at Sports Center. It's the part we're going to see Brian Gumbel talk about in Real Sports. Movement performance. All the wild and wacky stuff we do out there and the different ways we blend it together to give you a diet of exercise. But I promise you this. If you establish a systematic approach to movement health and a systematic approach to movement competency, you will not have a movement performance problem. But if you try to have movement performance without establishing those two things, you got a problem. So I'm going to make this ridiculously simple. If, the movements, if you do a movement screen and one of those movements hurts, you're not cleared for movement health yet. Now, what if the only move that hurts you is an upper body move and your lower body's fine? Am I saying you can't train your lower body? No. I'm saying don't do any lifting in the movement pattern where you experience pain. No good can come of it. And any strength you think you're getting ready to lose, it's already gone anyway because you're nowhere close to your maximum potential with pain on board. So, if I've got an unhealthy movement pattern, I need to establish health there. Now, what's the difference in movement health and movement competency? If you get a zero on the movement screen, that means you had pain in that movement pattern. And we've got a system that'll get you a bunch of answers to the questions you have, but you might have to involve another professional. Whereas, if you just move poorly, if you get a one on the movement screen, that's a movement competency issue. We deal with competency issues, not by coaching, but by correcting. If your vision's not 2020, I don't coach it up. I tell you, we're doing hand eye drills today. You might want to go get your contacts or glasses. <laughs> That's your correction. The movement screen will do both of these for you. And if you start building movement performance on top of that clean screen, then everything you know about performance comes into play. But now use this same thing. Don't leave any stone unturned. Don't just check strength. Because even in a strength sport, there is a minimum desirable level of range of motion. Even in an endurance sport like marathons, there is a minimal amount of strength I want each of these athletes to have. So when I'm advocating that a runner should lift and a lifter should stretch, I'm not doing it because I'm just into it. There is a minimum level of flexibility you need to get into your patterns. If I let you get a bit tighter, you're not just lifting the bar and the plates, you're working against your fascial planes and against your muscle tone. Making you boo better is taking weight off the bar because you're half the problem. You're thinking that bar's heavy. You can't even move in one body weight. When somebody can't squat their own body weight,
feels heavier when you squat because you're part of the problem. That's the movement screen. And one of the reasons that I've tried to change the way I talk about movement is the minute we start throwing these positions up, everybody's got an opinion about the positions we should check and do. But I didn't base mine on exercise, I based it on growth and development. And I picked each test specifically so it would have intentional redundancy. Now watch what we mean by that. Hips flexing, knees flexing, shoulders flexing, okay? Hips flexing, knees flexing, ankles flexing. This side's gotta be stable. This hip is extended, but the knee's bent. This hip is extended, but the knee's not bent. I'm checking hip extension two or three different ways. I'm checking hip extension right there. This redundancy allows me to see are you consistently limited in hip extension or are you only limited in hip extension in one position? If your hip extends right here and right here, but your hip doesn't extend right there, that could be a tight rectus femoris because it crosses both the hip and knee joint and the knees bend. So if all of a sudden you can't extend your hip in a lunge, but you can not extend in the other two, the lunge pattern tells me to go right to a corrective that's going to make you own half kneeling. How's that going to stretch my quad? It's not. It's going to make you not use your quad when you shouldn't be using your quad. One of the reasons your quad's so tight is you're using it when you should be using your glute. I'm going to put you in a position where your glute's the only thing that can help you and your quad can hurt you by trying to help you there. The natural patterns of growth and development give us all the isolation we'll ever need if we'll drop back. Training human beings ain't about progression. You must be equally willing to regress them. And that's not a negative. It's an opportunity to learn. Because at this point, you're not learning anymore. So we regress, learn more, move forward. So the tests are built to interact with each other. Biggest freshman mistake in the movement screen? I like this test, I like this test. <laughs> I delete all other tests because I am in fear of things I don't know, but I recognize this, I recognize this, these are my tests. <laughs> I'd rather you not do it at all than do it wrong. Because for us to make a difference with what we're trying to say with movement screening, we need a large part of the professional population not doing it. That way we can see how good you are. So don't do it or do it. I promise you. You're not qualified to modify it yet. I don't even know if I'm qualified to modify it. We got lucky on the front end because if we had made the movement screen more complex, reliability goes down and reliability is extremely important we need to be able to see the same thing so we can communicate it and if we can see and communicate about the same thing then we both by default are accountable and that's a good place to be it is a screen it is a screen a screen tells you if you need further assessment if you're doing assessments without screens you're you're doing it arbitrarily we should do MRIs on everybody's back we'd be treating a lot of people who didn't need treatment and a lot of people who had good MRIs and back pain wouldn't be getting what they need. We decide what we're going to do by multiple pieces of information. In movement screening, you got to keep the scoring simple because I'm putting you in categories. I am not measuring your movement. You're in a category of acceptable, optimal, dysfunctional, or pain. That's movement health. That's movement competency. So ones on the movement screen simply mean train the heck out of this pattern, correct the heck out of this pattern, don't load it greater than one body weight. So that means no impact and no external loads. Somebody tell me why. And it's not because of a risk of injury. That is not my first order of business. We are not loading an incompetent pattern. Why? We 
we're going to reinforce a bad pattern. And here's what the brain's going to do. Okay, wait, we don't have time to make it better. This is as good as it's going to get. I've got to employ the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand. I've got to start remodeling my fascia, refiring my muscles, adjusting tension, changing posture. Okay? So I don't have full shoulder mobility, I don't have good core control, and I've got a little bit of a painful neck four days a week. But look at my press. That's how we got here. We don't load the pattern because the minute you load a pattern with either impact or weight, the brain hits save on that document. And now it's a harder pattern to break. Which is why so many of you working with an athlete that's had some training habits for some time, you're breaking a long train of behavior. There's a lot of momentum in deadlifting with a rounded back and pressing with an anterior head. and wobbling on a single leg. Dysfunctional means measurable limitations in mobility or motor control, not complicated by pain. That means if somebody gets a one on the movement screen and you decide to break it down and put a goniometer on it or do a little strength test, you will always find something. You will find a specific thing to work on, maybe even a body part that's not functioning right but you didn't arbitrarily pick that body part based on what they say they feel. You picked it by the pattern that they couldn't hide. It's a much more honest exchange of information than asking somebody what their problem is. They're not qualified to tell you. It is part of their normalcy. Most of what they say is tight isn't tight, it's fatigued. And their tightest thing isn't even obvious to them because it's been so tight for so long, they don't think it moves anymore. So you can't perceive tightness where you don't have movement. A report of pain provoked by a movement pattern. It's that simple. A lot of people get confused by the FMS and the total score. Horse's mouth right here, okay? It ain't about the total score. Why did researchers think it was about the total score? Because researchers work with numbers. We threw out a test. It's obvious and it's a forgivable mistake. 21 must be the goal. It ain't the goal. Establishing normalcy is the goal, and twos on everything will get you that. So when you look at a movement screen, the first thing that should hit you is zeros. Do they have zeros? And I told the group this yesterday, and I'll tell you, 20% of the people that pass a pre-participation exercise or athletic physical by a medical doctor have pain on the movement screen. It's not just limited to high school kids. Pro athletes, tactical athletes, everyday fitness participants. 20% fail rate due to pain after a doctor says you're clear to exercise. Because a doctor cleared your cellular systems and your metabolic systems, they didn't clear your movement systems. So we got a 20% fail rate before the FMS score even comes into play. So if you took away everything in the FMS, including the score, and simply did those seven patterns on people who said they're willing to exercise, 20% of them probably aren't gonna be getting the benefit they think they're gonna get because they don't even have movement health. Poor platform for fitness. We can show you who's worse. Immediately, most people go to that higher score. But a high score can have time bombs in it. So your goal on the movement screen, this guy's got pain, he's got a high score, but they factored it with zero. Don't look at the total score. Don't have any zeros, don't have any ones. That's the goal. Two's on everything. But twos on everything is just at the acceptable level of movement. So if you start training somebody hard, what direction are they gonna go with movement? If you don't consider their movement profile in the workout, they're probably gonna go down, not up. 
They're going to give up flexibility to gain strength. They're going to give up movement quality to push more weight. Know that and engineer the program around that so poor movement isn't a side effect of increased performance because that's the only reason you know my name. I, like a lot of other people, realize that sometimes what we do in the name of performance makes you move more poorly. But instead of trying to create a prep or a stretch or my own foam roll to combat that, I try to develop a test so you can have your own gauge to watch it. And you'll get surprised sometimes. You'll do everything right and somebody's movement screen will go down a little bit. Own it, figure it out, you're gonna get better. Your eyes will change once you start looking at movement this way. The total score only matters in one direction. If you're below 14, there's something wrong because you can't get below 14 without having at least a one. And that's what that means. If we converted the entire FMS into pass fail, all right? So a three and a two both equal a two and a fail equals a one, you'd see the whole thing completely different. So this entire thing was said basically don't short sell the movement screen and look at it as a total score. I don't even talk to my athletes and clients about the scoring system because it's not something that they need to compete with. A high score doesn't mean everything's gonna be good and a low score doesn't necessarily mean that all hope is lost. It just means this is where you are today. Now, where does a three score help us? If you do three on a movement pattern, you are optimal in that movement pattern. How much do we need to prep that movement pattern? We don't need to prep the lunge before we work on the lunge. You're perfect in the pattern. We need to have a physiological warm up to get your state of readiness, to get your neurological system ready. But you don't need to stretch. We got a lot of people have no business stretching, but they do. Well, that just makes me feel better. There's no reason you should be stretching. Your mobility is not your weakest link. It might be a ritual you're used to going through, but it has no benefit on your fitness or performance whatsoever. So we're in the habit of stretching things that don't need to be stretched, and we're in the habit of strengthening things that we can't prove made us better. So we gotta keep dialing it back and looking at that performance and that movement. I don't like the term injury risk prediction. I like the term injury management. So if I know what your previous injuries are and I know where your pain is, if you still have it, if I know your FMS, if I also have a Y balance test and then we ask some psychosocial variables, now I'm dialing it in. The FMS has never been a standalone. It's a tool in a toolbox that will help you do that. So when I'm called in to a big time organization to put a lasso around injuries, I don't just give them an FMS kit and walk away. We have an entire system, and part of it is scrutinizing the program everybody's been on. And the first thing we do is platoon the groups. We don't just manage individuals with movement problems, we manage groups. So all my shoulder mobility problems in their preparation go right over there to the mat and they work on shoulder mobility. And all the people who have active straight leg raise or core stability problems, we platoon the problems in warm up, work them out together whenever possible. But when I say go do your corrective, which is a superset to what we're doing, your active rest is doing exactly what you need. I don't just warm you up and think you're going to move good. Moving bad is a habit, and moving good is a habit. Load it, pattern it, load it, pattern it, load it, pattern it, load it, pattern it. That's how you change a movement pattern not by doing this glorious preparation and not revisiting the pattern. You revisit the pattern after every load, after every impact, to make sure it's not eroding. These are simple things that, well, I could read them to you, but you can read. This is not an assessment in any way, but it'll tell you if you need one. FMS is our entry point. If you have major asymmetries with the FMS, especially if you're trying to get somebody ready for higher level competition, the Y balance test. 
I put it in the movement book, it's in there. The SFMA, top tier in breakouts, these are our medical movement screens and you need to find a medical professional that can employ this because it fits just like this with the FMS. You will always know what to do if you're using both these systems. Whether they're injured or not, you will always know what to do from a movement standpoint. We've tried to make it standard operating procedure because we don't have anything else to do right now. And I'm gonna leave you with a couple of slides. How many people in here make your major living in sports medicine or some type of rehabilitation or medical clinical profession? The role of sports medicine and rehabilitation is to get you strong enough to train. And my word strong here actually means healthy, okay? It's implied. So I'm talking mental, physical, whatever. The point of rehab is to get you strong enough to train or healthy enough to train. Now what are the complications we run into? Time, resources, education, but what is the key marker to watch if your job is medicine. That's it. If you're not managing that, you're not doing your job. And doesn't mean, I've had a lot of people I can't help, but part of my job is finding somebody who can help them. But I can't say you're strong enough or healthy enough to train if that's still on board, because pain complicates motor programming in inconsistent, in unpredictable ways. That means the software you're laying down every day training, even if we're not jumping up on that painful pattern, is gonna get you. So, we go through it like that. That's the SFMA in a nutshell. Role of strength and conditioning. Now I'm gonna leave you with this one. Get you strong enough to perform. Strength here means fitness. Same complications. Time's never on your side, resources could always be better, and education is always changing. What's a key marker to watch? Let's see if you get this one. State of readiness. That means sometimes your best advice is gonna be about recovery, or sometimes your best advice is gonna be about nutrition, or sleep, or we're not doing that lift today because you don't have enough movement to support it. State of readiness. Are you ready to train? And if you're not, what'll get you there? Think about that. If the medical professionals were to do what they were supposed to do with pain, and you did what you were supposed to do with state of readiness, we wouldn't be here. Because nobody would ever get a load they didn't deserve, and people would only be pushed when they could accept the load and they wouldn't have to be doing it with pain because we'd be doing our job. That's my vision and my voice held out. Thank you.